Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule, because I know it is busy, and it takes a little bit to draw yourself away from uh, the afternoon of classes and work and all that other stuff to come and see boring people talk. So tonight, I'm going to introduce you to the fine world of bootstrapping. Now, bootstrapping, what is that? Anybody wearing boots right now? Yeah? Okay, who's got a pair of bloodstones on? Anybody? No? Does anybody at the back of their boots have a little strap that you stick your finger in to pull your boot on? Like that one right there? Can you see that? That's your boot? Oh, you got one. All right. Do you got bl blood stones on? Okay, good. But you got a boot strap. All right. So we're going to talk about that little thing on the back of your shoe called a boot strap. Now, why am I here and uh, why is this so important to me? So um, the interesting thing about uh, why I'm here is that, A, I'm not really a, uh, a professor. I'm actually a guy from the industry. I spent uh, 20 years in the film and television business. And before then, uh, I spent a lot of time in the, uh, what I would consider to be menial job labor market. So I understand everything about not wanting to work for other people and maybe wanting to work for yourself. Um, so, another quick fact, I was an archaeologist uh, 25 years ago and uh, currently I'm an archaeologist again. So, even you can go from being one position to another position and back to uh, wherever you want to go. So, bootstrapping. Why am I excited about this? Everybody talks about startup uh, business, venture business. Nobody really talks about the nuts and bolts of actually starting a company. And that's the important thing here, because we're all, we've been hearing this word entrepreneurship, innovation. We've got these ideas floating around our, in our heads. We call them the mental map, that we see this picture out there, and we're going to be that uh, next business star. But nobody tells us actually how we get there. You know, whether or not we should incorporate federally or provincially, whether or not uh, we have to follow AODA rules, or whether or not we have to file our taxes every month or every year. So these are the little things, the operational components that make up a bootstrapping mentality, as well as we're going to mix in a lot of entrepreneurship as well. Before there was a Mark Zuckerberg, there is the traditional social network, and that's what this is. You're networking. This is part of the entrepreneurial bootstrapping technique, is that you constantly want to be introducing yourselves to new people. And this is your cohort. If I told you a statistic, I would, uh, you wouldn't believe me. So the first statistic is, is that at least one person in here will hire or fire another person in here in the course of your next 30 or 40 years of business life. So it's important to ensure, come on in, it's okay, ensure that you are connecting up with as many people as possible. So bootstrapping. Now, bootstrapping started uh, many, many hundreds of years ago. I think it's a pretty easy uh, concept to take in, uh, in the fact that if you need money and you gotta survive, you're going to pretty much do anything that your talent is going to provide you the ability to do so. From an academic perspective, bootstrapping itself, the concept of bootstrapping actually originally originated in the 1800s. And it came from a single article that occurred in about 1821. And it, it was a uh, local uh, uh, newspaper, farmer's newspaper down in the United States, about a farmer let's call him Farmer Joe, who pulled himself up over the fence, over his fence line, by his own bootstraps. Okay, now we've already concluded that there's a bootstrap on the bottom, back of your boot here. So he, he used his own boots, bootstraps to pull himself over a fence. Now, why is that remarkable? Basically what they were saying in the newspaper was, this guy is crazy, he's going to go off and do his own thing, why doesn't he just follow the same thing that everybody else is doing? Okay. Later on in the uh, 30s and 40s, you guys, uh, you must have taken the dirty 30s, you know, history. 
when there was the stock crash and people were uh, unemployed and they had to move from town to town and town. Back then, the concept of bootstrapping was really about taking your yourself up out of the dirt and brushing yourself off and becoming successful. If, has anybody watched The Great Gatsby? Or read the book? So that, The Great Gatsby, is a great example of the bootstrapping mentality that the United States was developing over the 1930s. And to this day, most of the concept of bootstrapping itself really comes from the U US approach to, I'm going to be successful. That a guy or a girl with no money in their pockets can then go out and succeed. So, do you have what it takes to be a bootstrapper? So let's see what the experts tell us. So here are the big five. Has anybody heard of these before? The big five of entrepreneurship? These are psychological measurements to determine whether or not you've got the ability to actually be an entrepreneur or a bootstrapper. So the first one is, uh, <laughs> I can never say, <laughs> Extrovert, it's basically extroversion. So are you an extrovert? How many people are extroverts? Did you know that we have two personas? We actually have multiple personas. We have the persona that is our external persona. We have our internal persona. And then we have our, our stressed persona, okay? And by the way, um, the slide deck will be available to you guys uh, after the the talk. So I'm an extrovert when I'm in front of large crowds, okay, when I have to get up and I have to perform. But in reality, when we're in a social environment, I'm an introvert. I don't like to talk to anybody. I like to stand off to the side and watch how things play out. And that's my external and my internal persona. And then, well, that's another thing you have to think about. This is part of your entrepreneurial toolkit. You have to sit, sit down and write down, okay, when I get stressed, how do I feel? Okay, and be honest about it. When I'm happy, how do I feel? And when I'm day to day, what is that feeling? And you'll find that there's some, cog uh, some elements that are similar to each other. So according to the big five, being an uh, Extrovert is a very good entrepreneurial trait. Emotional stability. Hmm. What do you think that means? You're the Martha Stewart of entrepreneurship? Got to give it to Martha Stewart. You know, she really did get railroaded, spent some time in jail, and she was rock solid the whole way through. So there was some emotional stability in there. Her ability to see the big picture and be able to get through the tough times. It's also the ability to look at situations and determine what the best outcome is for that particular situation. We have them every day, right? You're going down to the uh, subway, someone bumps you, you're, you know, you're, you're not in the frame of mind, you could either say something or not say something. So all of those sort of micro decisions are helping you determine what your emotional stability is. In our particular case, for the big five, the stability component is, is that you've got some dedication to what you need to do. Agreeableness. When, so when someone comes up to you and says, can you do this for me, what do you say? Yes. Say yes. Let's all say it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Come on. Oh, look, it's hard. It's hard for us to say it, right? OK, let's try it a different way. No. No. See, it's a little easier to say no than it is to say yes. My recommendation, if you want to be an entrepreneur and a bootstrapper, always say yes. Now, saying yes sometimes gets you into trouble. So you have to qualify your ability to deliver on that yes. So agreeableness, that means are you able to work in teams? Are you able to listen as well as uh, provide support, okay? Because being an entrepreneur or being an owner of a company doesn't mean that you make all the decisions. It just means that 
you've got the ability to take in information that you're learning from all of your people that you're working with. Conscientiousness. Conscientiousness means to finish a job that you start. You know, the ability to see it all the way through, through the long and the tough times. Last one is open to experience. How many people here, if I said I will pay for you to skydive out of a plane tonight in Toronto, how many people would say yes? Okay, a little over two thirds. Okay, open to experience. When you're open, you have the ability to at least be able to say yes or no. Okay, and what do we always want to say? Yes, that's right. So when we're open to these questions, we have the ability to understand all of the ramifications, both positive and negative to it. Now, here's the last one. Have you guys heard of this term before, risk averse? The banks like to throw this around, don't they? They like to, when you go in and you say, you know, I need $10,000 know, for my student loan. I can't get this and blah, blah, blah. The bank will say, you're too risk E, right? They're risk averse. Now, this term actually comes from uh, a couple of cool cats, uh, Canahan and Tversky, and they came up with a uh, uh, really great theory. And basically, their theory was this, is that if you're given an opportunity for a sure bet, you will generally take the sure bet. But if you are constantly betting on the same thing over and over again and losing, you will bet more in order to gain back what you've lost. So it's a di uh, diametrically opposed concept. How many people go to play the slots? I'm a slot guy. No? Nobody <laughs> plays the slots. Just me flicking my quarters or my nickels into the machine, you know, going like this. Anybody play roulette, poker? All right. Do you guys like playing it? Do you, do you put a limit to how much money you're going to spend? Yeah? What I tell my, I have two kids, uh, a 10-year-old and a 16-year-old, and I say, you can make as much mistakes as possible. Just don't make the same mistake twice. Okay? So, are you risk averse? If you were to leave school right now and whatever you had left in OSAP, you're going to look in the bank and say, okay, I've got 2000 bucks. Would you guys go and spend it on uh, starting a new company? Yeah. yeah? I like that. You just jumped right in. Okay. We need to think about that a little bit longer, but that's good. <laughs> so we all have a level of risk aversion in ourselves, and we just have to understand what our, our $20 limit is. So, okay, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna really talk about building a company for a sec, and uh, I didn't realize uh, all of you guys hadn't done the other courses yet, so um, this might be new to you. Um, and really, we haven't even gone into bootstrapping yet. So there's two things that I want to bring to your attention. Ah, there we go. So there's a, going to be another course in startup school, and they will cover lean startup methodology. I highly recommend that you take a look at it. It was developed by a guy named uh, Eric Ries, and he came up with this theory after going to Japan and looking how the Japanese created their automotive industry. It was basically just-in-time manufacturing, okay? That was the lean approach to the industry. His concept was that you have rapid ideation, that you create a minimal viable product, you get it out to the clients, get them testing it, if there's any problems, fix those problems, and do the iteration over again, okay? So lean startup methodology. He applied that to the business approach, meaning how do we uh, rapidly come up with our ideas and get it out to the clients. Now, the difficulty here is that the concept lean startup methodology has been hijacked. 
Okay, because when we say lean, what do we think? Lacking. Cheap, right. right? Lacking, very good. So now this term is about how can we get our business up and running with as little money as possible. But that's not what Eric really intended it to be. The other area that you'll look at is business model canvas. And it was developed by Alexander, and I, I'm not even going to attempt to his last name because I hack it all the time. He created a methodology that will allow you in one sheet to identify the business that you want to start. Okay? And it's based on a series of modules. I'm not going to get into it because that's going to be another startup school class. Um, but I highly uh, recommend that you take a look for his name and uh, come on in and uh, uh, take a look at what he's done. And when the startup school class uh, shows up, definitely do it. What we're going to talk about really <coughs> is bootstrapping from this perspective. We've already done the Lean Canvas model. We've already done the, uh, uh, the concept of Lean Startup. And we have an idea and we're ready to go, OK? Now, you need two things in bootstrapping. One is cash, and the other one is a minimal viable product. And look at that. There we go. MVP, minimal viable product. OK, everybody cool so far? Yeah? I was like you this morning, too. I was thinking, oh, man, I spent all weekend on this. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll be good. So, cash and MVP. Cash. This is the number one reason everybody fails in their startup business. They don't understand the market. I love this picture. So is the market the dog? Is it the clown? Maybe it's the, the hoop the clown holds. Or maybe it's the barrel. You have to identify what the market is. And I talk a lot about mental maps, these, these images that we put in our head. I'm going to be an entrepreneur, so I'm going to dress like Mark Zuckerberg in my you know, expensive hoodies, my runners, and so forth, and I'm going to take on the persona. And in reality, we get so wrapped up on wanting to be an entrepreneur, wanting to be part of the ecosystem, that we actually forget why we're starting our business in the first place. So the real question, hey, come on in. The real question you want to ask yourselves is, what problem do I want to solve? Okay? Not what type of job do I want, not type, what type of app I want to create, but what problem am I solving? Now I'll give you a link up here at StatsCan. Um, I love Stats Canada. I think the Conservatives did a, uh, a poor disservice by uh, reducing the amount of money they used to throw at it. Hopefully the Liberals will be a little bit smarter and actually put money back into Stats Can. It is a mine of gold that we can go into on a regular basis and test our theories. So if you think that trainers selling uh, Jordan uh, retro trainers are the cat's meow for Toronto. You can look up in StatsCan and find out how many stores actually sell sports shoes. You can find out how many people buy sports shoes by their age, by their gender, by the district that they live in, where the hottest spots in Toronto are in order to buy these goods. You may look at it and you say to yourself, oh, there's way too many businesses out there selling these trainers. But what if you built an app? Maybe that app is pooling all of the inventory from all of these places, and now you've become the broker. So you're solving a problem. Maybe the problem is I can't find a particular, I got size 13 feet. And I can't find those 19, uh, 92 Jordan trainers that I had back way, way back when, the Nike ones, okay, the real expensive ones. And 
I gotta find my size. So maybe I use your app or your website to type in my size and it gives me a listing of all the places I can go. And in doing so, that service that you've provided takes a skim off the top. So StatsCan is a great place for you to look and to experiment on the types of clientele that you may want to attack, okay? Because remember, you are solving them a problem. Why do you guys buy iPhones? How many people have iPhones? How many people have Blackberries? All right. Good for you, man. So that identification of who has what is very important. And if you're going to go out and you're going to say, you know, this new BlackBerry Priv is the best thing on the market, I'm going to build some software for it, you're going to have to find out whether or not two-thirds of the class are going to use that, right? Do some research. The first thing I would ask you to do is if you're going to start a business, you're going to put your money down because you're going to do that. I'm going to show it to you. Do some research. So, number two, cash flow is king. I'm going to say that again. Cash flow is king. You need that cash coming in. So, we're going to talk about a couple of concepts here. So when you decided to go to school, what was the first thing you did? Or what was the first thing your parents did? They sat you down and they asked you to write down all of your expenses, right? How much do you think it would cost to go to school? So at the top we have minimal livability plan, okay, the MLP. That is basically your budget. How many people sit down at the end of the month and say, okay, my budget for next month is going to be X, Y, and Z, right? You know, we all do it. We do it mentally or we'll sit down and we'll write it. That is your budget and it's totally based on common basic information. It's not a drill down, this is really what I'm spending. The next one is the MVL, the Minimal Viable Life. And that is basically all the money that's coming into you, okay? So if you're doing gigs on the side, you're doing uh, bartending, you're, uh, you know, you're a supermodel at night and you're raking in the cash, you have to call all that information together. And that is what we call a runway, okay? That is the amount of money that you have to spend on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. How many people do that? What? All right, congratulations. You need to think about how much money, if you were to get sick tomorrow, if you were to decide, I am not going to work again until my business is up and rolling, you have to figure out what your runway is. Meaning, I've got four or five months to get my idea off the ground. Right, Cliff? And the next, last one here is personal cash burn, PCM, or PCB. Um, this is what we call a burn rate. What I just asked you to do by recording on the back of your napkins is how much money you're actually spending. Does anybody have like a receipt tracker on their phone? Do you guys use it? Or is it there for a show? Oh, no. You use it. Okay. What, if you were in one of my grad, so I didn't tell you who I was or anything like that, but I teach a graduate uh, class and uh, I help found uh, the graduate program uh, in the Masters in Digital Media, embedded in the Digital Media Zone. And one of my classes is this, bootstrapping. And the first thing I get the students to do on their first day is to track every nickel and dime they spend for an entire month. I, come on. I have one ingenious young man who uh, spends a lot of money on tea on a weekly basis. So we understand now where a lot of his money is going to, okay? So that is his actual burn. But in his budget, he hasn't budgeted for tea. 
So what's happening? What he thinks is he needs, or the amount of money he thinks he needs to survive isn't really the amount of money he's spending. Okay? If there's one thing I can uh, stress upon enough, it's the fact that you need to understand where the money is going. Okay? Everybody cool so far, right? Nobody's falling asleep? Good. Okay, all right. So, personal savings. Oh, sorry, I should have said personal savings here. So the reason why I'm asking you of where your money is and your cash flows and all this other stuff is because when you start that company, that bootstrapping company, you're going to be taking the money out of your own pocket and spending it on a whole hoard of different things that you need to get your business up and going. So everybody dip into their pockets right now. I just want to know what the cash is. How much cash you got? You got no money on you. Nothing. Nothing? I got four dollars and twenty-five cents. Exactly or just around? Yeah, just give me a rough estimate. Forty-six dollars and fifty cents. Forty-six bucks and fifty cents. Anybody else yet, dude? You got two thousand bucks on you. What are you doing here, man? <laughs> come, come and see me, brother. <laughs> Okay, so we're getting close. If we pooled all of our money together, our cash money, we would have a runway. And then we would decide what we could do with that money to start a business, okay? Now, that is your personal savings. And that will be, I can tell you that I started my company without spending a dime. I had a multi-million dollar production company and I didn't spend a dime to start it up. All I did was I walked into the client, my client's office one day and they were, I was pitching something entirely different. Now remember, I'm in the film and television business. I should have said that. I spent 20 years as a, started out off as an animator and then within 10 years I was an executive producer for Alliance Atlantis and everybody's watched uh, Wallace and Gromit yeah, uh, so I worked at Ardman and at various uh, studios around the world, in New York and LA and Japan and so forth. And I walked in one day to my client and I was pitching them an idea because I'm in children's television. Anybody watch Handy Manny? All right, yeah. So we produced some of Handy Manny and another show called Will and Do It and uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, Wallace and Gromit, the Were Rabbit. I was on that one. Um, but as I was talking, I was also listening to my clients' concerns. And they were complaining that they couldn't find anybody in Canada to produce a particular show. So I, I took my idea that I was pitching to them and I said, ah, I'm going to put this off to the side. And I said, well, what if you bought me all of the equipment? I hired the people, I took your pain point, and I produced it, and in exchange, I will do it for every nickel. You will see every nickel where I've spent it, and in exchange, I get 10%. That was a guarantee. Remember when we're talking about risk averse? What will most people do when they see a guarantee? They'll take it. And that's what my client did. So without a nickel in my pocket, I was able to look at the situation, listen to the client, hear what their pain point was, and present them with an alternative option, which was within their realm of acceptance. Okay? I didn't go and ask for a million dollars to start up a business, although the equipment they bought me was a million dollars. For friends and family, if you need cash to start up, and if you don't have that opportunity where there's a ready-made client and you've got a reputation, because I'd already been with Alliance Atlantis, so they knew who I was, they knew I was an executive producer, they knew I could put, my specialty is building animation studios, so they knew I could build a studio. So all of that, those, those check marks were checked off very quickly, okay? The only thing I didn't have was I didn't have $10,000 in the bank to sort of say, if I screw up, you can take this. So that was a little bit of a risk. 
So if you guys don't have that, you have to go to friends and family and ask them for money. Okay? That's your traditional bootstrapping technique. Now, I will caution you a little bit about doing so because how many people love their family? <laughs> you love your family, right? You add money into the mix and there's not going to be no love. No. Your, <laughs> your dad's going to be saying, well, you know, I could really use that $10,000 I lent you. Uh, I want to go down to Florida. And I'm thinking, but you just gave me the 10 grand last week. So, Friends and family, if you value your friendship and you value your family, you may want to think about whether or not that's a, a wise decision. Now, if you do decide to go down that route, do it from a business perspective. Set up a contract. Set out the terms of the contract. My mother is going to lend me 20 bucks. I owe her $20 plus 1% interest for the next five years or until I pay off the loan. Have both parties sign it so you understand at least that there is a business agreement and that your friends and family can't com come back and ask you for the money two days later. Okay? So more than likely, money is the biggest uh, issue when it comes to friends and family. So be, be cautious about it. But a traditional bootstrapping technique is to go after them. Now, in a, when I say not venture capital, because when we're talking about bootstrapping, we're not talking about stage one financing, okay, where you're going after VC money, because you really haven't started the company yet. And if the, anybody comes up to you and says, you know, I'm going to go and get some other, somebody else's money to work for me, they better have a shit hot product because all the VCs are going to look at that shit and say, well, sorry, did I swear? <laughs> I guess it's past five. Um, they're going to say, forget it. Go get me a business plan and show me that you're not a risk. So I like, who said grants? You said grants, right? Okay, cool. So your third option here is to go for grants, awards, interest-free loans, the Biz Business Development Bank of Canada gives you an interest-free loan up to a certain period of time. Um, Co-sharing, so that's, uh, you know, friends, colleagues, uh, business associates have uh, three desks in their office that uh, they need to rent out and you decide that you're going to rent or they're going to give them to you uh, as part of their generosity. Um, incubators and accelerators. Now the Digital Media Zone is an incubator meaning we provide space, mentorship, uh, heat, telephone, internet, I said internet, uh, you know, all the photocopying, all that other stuff. And an accelerator is we give you all that stuff and we give you money as well. Okay, so that's really kind of a pre-stage financing component. You guys good so far? These are the websites of some of the places that you can find money. MentorWorks is a company that will find you money for a fee. Generally, their fee is between 8 to 12%. So they will put the application together for you. They'll sit down and find out what types of pools of money that you can get from the feds and the governments and the independents and so forth. And they'll make those applications out. Canadianbusiness.ca uh, is a good place to uh, hang, uh, hang out. Fundingportal.com and the uh, uh, Ryerson as well, the DMC. So you're going to find areas where you can uh, pick up some cash. I will tell you, it is not easy. Okay, You will need that business plan. So especially with uh, people who are going to lend you more than $2,000, they want to see a business plan. Um, they're going to want to understand where you're spending that money. So that budget, that runway, and so forth. You guys are still cool? Okay. Nobody's asleep, right? No? Okay. I never know. Okay. This is, and my friend Cleo here was talking to me about this today. Sometimes you have to do other work in order to get 
your company off the ground. Now I said a couple of things. One is understand what the pain point is. Don't just think that this widget, this, this BMOP that you're going to make for yourself, if anybody saw that during Christmas, um, is going to solve the world's problems. Try to solve problems that you feel every day. So for instance, going to the TTC, I, I can only buy a TTC tickets if I've got my, uh, my debit card with me. Well, why can't I buy it on a phone or a, you know, a Visa card or something like that? Something easy. Why can't I have a digital token when I walk on the, the bus? So this is a something that four million people in Toronto feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So solve a problem first. The other is listen to your client. So if your client is telling you, I really love your idea, I really love your idea, Cleo, but I think you're, you've got this amazing energy that I think is excellent for this thing. Do you mind coming and working and doing that? So be flexible. The client may want you to do this where you want to do that. If you do a little of this, that might get you to here. Because why? Cash flow is king. Cash flow is king. You want to make sure that there's money coming in all the time. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. If you're an entrepreneur starting a business, you're working a second job or you're working a third or fourth job. Okay? You got a question? No, you're cool? Okay, good. Banks. <laughs> I love this picture. Anybody work at a bank here? I won't hold it against you. Are you you're the back end guy, right? Guy, uh, right? Yes. You're a teller? Uh, customer service. Okay, customer service. Do not phone up. Which bank do you work for? <laughs> BMO. Okay, good. Don't call it BMO and hassle my friend here. So banks. Banks are only concerned with one thing. And what's that? Taking your money, making money. They're not interested in loaning you money because you are a risk. Aversion. You're a risk. You're a risk. So, a couple of things. Um, when you go for a business loan, they're going to want to have something in exchange for lending you that money. They want to make sure that you can pay that back. How many people own a, a car? Okay. That car is an asset. And if you, have you paid off your car? Paid off your car? Okay, good. Have you? All right. So your car is now worth 4,000 bucks. That's an asset the bank can acquire if you do not pay back your loan. That's a guarantee. It secures your loan. So even if you're getting a business loan, the bank will ask you to personally guarantee its repayment. I had, in 2008, when the recession hit, did everybody remember that recession? The housing market? Oh my god. All of my clients were American broadcasters. Soon as the, you know, Fannie Mae or whatever, Mac, all I could, my head was spinning. Uh, as soon as that hit, my broadcasters all phoned up and said, we can't make payment. And I'm thinking, my burn rate is $50,000 a day. How am I going to pay my people on contracts that you've agreed to pay? Give us a little time. Do this. Do that. I had to go to the bank. I had to go to my personal bank that I dealt with for 20 years. The bank that has all of my personal banking in, my mortgages, my house, my car, my... Uh, uh, orthodontics, you know, the whole nine. So they've got everything. And I went to my bank and I said, I need to make payroll because my clients aren't paying. What do you own? What do you mean, what do I own? You know what I own. I got a house here. Okay. We can give you a $50,000 loan secured on that house. So here's a business loan secured on a personal asset. 
even though I sat, the studio had half a million dollars worth of equipment in it, the bank looks at that as zero. Usually the bank will ask you to secure a loan against personal assets. Usually the bank will give you a bank business prime. What's prime rate right now? 2.7 for a mortgage. The bank's prime is 0.5% roughly. Okay? That is not your prime. Your prime will be 7 or 8%. Okay? I don't want to age anybody. But does anybody, did anybody have a car loan back in the 80s? No? I did, and that was 21%. The bank loan is 78% plus a risk aversion fee on top of that. So at the end of the day, you could be paying anywhere between 9 to 11% on, on whatever money you use. So use the bank money sparingly. Okay? Don't think of it as your first place to go. And they will require, they're the only ones who really require a uh, true 50 page business plan. Yeah, which is crazy because nobody makes business plans anymore. Okay, that's all doom and gloom, right? You guys, you guys, you know, not thinking entrepreneurship anymore? Let's, but there's some upside as well. So, how do we get this business uh, moving fast? Anybody heard of Guy Kawasaki? Guy's like a guru in entrepreneurship. He actually wrote a book on bootstrapping, and he takes it from a venture capital perspective. One of his things is that you always want the cash going in as fast as possible, okay? In our particular case, you want to agree to smaller and faster, smaller jobs and faster payments. Don't go after the big jobs. They, a big job takes longer time to negotiate. So if it's a $10,000 job, it may take you several months to get that agreement in place. But if you can get 10 jobs at $1,000 each and get them done within three months, the money's in your pocket already. Request fast payments. So on your contract, you say, you know, I'm doing this for below scale, but I'd like you to pay me in 30 days. Does anybody know what a normal payment schedule is for a corporation? 90 days? It's usually 90 to 120 days, especially for uh, small-time companies like ourselves. So 120 days, that could be a life or death for the entrepreneurial. Um, in exchange, negotiate payments that are longer, 90 days and 120 days, to all of the people you owe money to. <coughs> okay? Start off right at the beginning. If a, uh, if a company is going to lend you some money for equipment, say, can I have 120 days to pay that back? Can I pay that back in installments? Can I lease the equipment? Can I lease the equipment and give it back to you after a year if things don't work out? Okay. Always w do work for money or exchange services. How many people do things for free here? Actually, I think I'm getting paid for this today, right? So, okay, I'm not. <laughs> I love doing it. Do not do anything for free. Okay, no problem. Even if you got to ask for a buck, even if it was a $10,000 job that they're asking you to do for free, ask for a buck because there's a monetary exchange that has occurred. That means there's paperwork that is put into play. That means that if you do not deliver, they can sue you for what? Buck. A buck. A buck, okay? Make sure that your labor is worth something. Now, there's plenty of times, and I've done this over the last 30 years in my, uh, my business, where I've given away things for free. In fact, I did once 
one of the first Lego animated shorts, and that cost us $50,000, okay? It was a pitch. Still, it was 50 grand out of my pocket to get a potential opportunity. That never panned out. Whereas if I had just told the client, pay me a buck, but I own everything. I own the assets, I own the designs, I own the characters. Things may have worked out differently. Maybe I would have been making the Lego movie and singing the happy dance or whatever that damn song my 10 year old sings all the time. So it's important for you guys to always um, do things for a monetary value. You can also exchange. So for instance, if I need a PR uh, person, I'll go to Cleo. And uh, Cleo may need something else, accounting or legal advice or tax credit information. I'm very good at uh, tax credit Excuse information. Me? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. That was my, uh, my shtick back then. Okay, reoccurring revenue. This is money that works for you. I love it. Does anybody, have, anybody sell their stuff on eBay right now? or some other form of eBay? No? Hmm. You know, 10 years ago, my wife, she was on eBay, you know, 24 hours a day. Got to buy that book, buy, buy that Kate Spade purse, everything. And now, I've got a closet full of Kate Spade purses I'd love to put on eBay. Make me some passive revenue. So, uh, reoccurring revenue is one of the key blocks of the business model canvas that uh, I talked to you about. And that is money that is constantly generating itself. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, subscriptions, or if you're watching a television series, they want you to buy the next episode over and over again. Or Netflix, for instance. Netflix, they, on they only charge you $7.99, right? That's not a lot of cash. But when you get like a, a million or two million people, that's a reoccurring amount of money that comes in on a regular basis that they can forecast over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, make passive revenue work for you. Anybody write a book here? No? Okay, let's just say my dear friend, um, Sean Weiss, who started uh, Startup School, he's written a book. He's got it all on the internet, the interweb, as they like to say, us old people. And that interweb, you can go on it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and buy that book. I can buy it here. I can buy it over in Germany. I can buy it in Japan, any time of the day. That is called passive revenue, because you're not doing anything. You, the person who created this, uh, this uh, wealth environment, you just sit back and you have this money currently coming to you. Okay. This is my favorite part. Notice how everybody's having a party. Capital efficient. Now, who has really been spending time looking at, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Just raise your hands. Like, have you been doing some research? Have you gone to the DMZ? Anybody, who, who, whoever hasn't gone to the DMZ, feel free to stop by any time. It's part of Ryerson, it's not a fortress. You walk in, you say, hey, I'd like a tour of the DMZ. Sign up, go onto their website, and go for the tour. Go to Mars, go to 111 Richmond, which is another, I, accelerator, incubator. Um, those places are places that you would go in order to save money as you're starting up your company because the rent is cheaper or it's free and they're providing you uh, lots of opportunities and services. Now, when I make it big, I hit the big time and then my clients are starting to give me lots of money. What's the first thing I do? Go on a cruise. I love it. Kimmy, you and I, I love cruises. Yeah, we're good. We spend it, right? So we're, con oh, expense the cruise? 
yeah. So it's important for us to remember that when we, when, when you get money, when you guys get that tax break, you know, that money comes in from H and R Block. What do you get? What's the first thing you do with it? Mortgage. You pay pay off the mortgage. Ooh, I like that. Anybody else? Pay off debt. Does anybody just go out and say, "Hey, you know what? I earned that tax break. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy myself a new pair of pants. Or I'm gonna go out and buy a new car." Oh, there we go. So, part of the problem that we have is that when we think start getting good, we want to loosen up the purse strings a little bit, right? And we go out and we buy stuff. The same thing is for uh, startup companies. Okay, they'll go out and buy that beanbag chair or that ping pong table because it's cool and it's supposed to be part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, startup. You know, that's what a startup people do. I'm going to go and get myself a loft penthouse office because that's what's cool. You know what I say that is? It's a waste of money. Actually, any company that goes and puts a name on a building from being a startup to getting, say, eight, eight, 10, 15, 20 million dollars in uh, VC capital and puts their name on the building, you have to think about why are you doing that? Does that money make you money? Does that sign going to make you money? So instead of going out and spending that cash that you get, you have to make that money work for you. Paying off debt, bringing in another smart person, buying the equipment you may need. Okay, so be cap uh, capital efficient. Do not buy the pinball machine. Because those antique machines are very expensive now. They're worth two grand. I know where I can get two grand, so that we can pick one up later on. We're good? Okay, good. It'll look great in my office on the sixth floor in the DMZ. So don't believe the hype. This one is gonna be hard to swallow, my friends. Cash flow is king. You don't pay yourself. You pay everybody else around you. And if you got two nickels to rub together, you put that back in the bank and save it for the next month. So as an entrepreneur, you have to be thrifty. You have to have the fortitude, the conscientiousness to be able to say, I don't need that new pair of shoes. I can stick with these ones. I don't need that membership at the Spoke Club, right? Although the Spoke Club is a great place to go, I can still take my meetings at the DMZ or the SLC or wherever. Your expenses should be reflective of your sales. So if you're out buying a BMW, does that BMW generate money for your company? No. Okay, next. Minimal viable product. Well, we're cool with the cash flow thing, right? I apologize. I know it sounds like I'm hitting you on the head on it, um, but honestly, a month from now, I'm going to get five people come up and say, hey, what about this? I just put $2,000 down. Or, uh, you know, just recently, someone said, I just put $50,000 down. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the pain point you're solving? This pain point is the minimal viable product, okay? This is the item, the widget, the thing, the service, or whatever that you are going to send out to the clients and get them to pay you money for. How many people have used Windows over the years and said, are those guys not paying attention to their code? Because Windows comes in, you start playing with it, and you realize what the hell is going on. They're using the lean startup methodology, actually. They're using minimal viable product. They send it out to the clientele. The clients bitch and complain. They figure out where the bugs are. They go and fix it. Iteration after iteration after iteration. So you constantly want to rapidly prototype your idea. You want to get that thing out that everybody's going to potentially put, pay money you, or give you money for. 
but as soon as they start complaining or as soon as they say, hey, you know, instead of walking, I'd rather rollerblade, you got to be quick on your toes, rapidly prototype it. You have to then go back and release it and test it out on the market. We talked a lot about A-B testing. Uh, is anybody here thinking about doing a digital media idea? Okay. So come back. Um, there's a couple companies that do A-B testing. So you look that up. The other one, um, there's a company that I'm, I'm dealing with just recently from uh, New Zealand, and they have a full um, sort of Adobe Photoshop style software application that la lets you make an app without a, a programmer. It's called Umagine. It's pretty cool, actually. So, what is it called? Umagine, U M M A M A J I N. Umagine. These are the types of companies that will help you validate whether or not your product is ready to go. Sorry. The important thing is always every time you do something that you reflect on it. Are you giving the best thing to your clients? Are you providing all the material that they require? And then once you get their feedback, you have to remember that it's always the customer and not the product that is the most important thing. How many times do you sit around the dinner table, you're drinking a glass of wine or a beer and you say, Shit, you know, if I made that, people will buy it like crazy, right? I think the pizza's here. You know, I, once they set up, I'm going to say go down and get a piece of pizza, and then we can keep on talking. Um, Cleo, I'm going to let them come down after you've all set up. You guys are hungry, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, good. So, it's not our interpretation of what the client needs, it's what the client is telling us the client needs, okay? That's what the important part is. Okay, now we're on to the good stuff. We're talking about the A-team. The team that's gonna get you through the thick and thing of it, uh, you know, the terrible times, the good times. You want people who are committed to you, okay? If you want to surround people with those individuals who are going to work night and day to get your product out the door, to get your idea out the door, who will follow you to bankruptcy to get this thing going. Are you that type of leader? Do you have people following you? when things are a little iffy? Because if you are, you have a good opportunity to become an entrepreneur. I can tell you that my success over the last 20 years has not been about me. It is about the people who surround me. Those are the smart people. I'm just the guy that says, oh, maybe we could do this. And then everybody else evaluates it. So the first thing is, make sure you have people who are committed to your vi vision. Next thing, has anybody ever heard of the term unicorns? So we use in the business world this term unicorns to describe uh, businesses that uh, sort of sprouted out of nothing. So Facebook is a great example of that. Or people who are so charismatic that they're able to create gold by snapping their fingers. Let me tell you, unicorns don't exist. Okay? So, we're talking about unicorns. And there's a lot of unicorns out in this world. And these are guys, guys and girls, who have already been through the process a couple times. And they have, remember when I talked to you about executive producers? They have contacts and they have money. Now, Sometimes they want to do, they want to help you out for free. Sometimes they want a chunk of your company. Sometimes they want a big paycheck. So you have to define when you're putting your team together whether or not having these individuals on your team is a good idea. 
Guy Kawasaki and myself both agree on the same thing. It's better to leave the uni unicorns in the mythical lands where they come from because it's going to cost you way too much money in the end. Unicorns are generally other entrepreneurs, which means they're not going to concentrate all their time on your business. You want somebody who's going to concentrate 150% on your company. Now, we also have uh, mentor networks. There's a beautiful um, startup community here in Toronto. It's very strong. It's recognized in uh, North America as being a, a tier one. Tap into it. Go to these events. Get some free pizza. Have a beer. You know, schmooze with people. Get your pitch down. So you may not have a particular idea right now, but you may want to say, I'm looking to, to start working in a, in a new startup company. I think I'm really good at this, this, and this. And I can help you get to where you want to go. You don't necessarily, you necessarily have to start creating a company. You could help create somebody else's company. Um, this is a big thing as well. It's funny that we're eating pizza tonight, too. I'm talking about it. Um, only hire the people that you absolutely need. Okay? Has any, anybody heard of the talent triangle? No? Okay. Any business that you have, actually. Yeah, Sean just. Okay, so the talent triangle is very simple. Most successful businesses have three elements that are equal to each other. <coughs> Business, technical, and creative. So if you look at yourself as a company, you say to yourself, oh, I'm really creative and I'm a good business person, but I really suck at being a technical person. What do you do? You find a technical co-founder or a technical person that will help complement your skill set. So always think of the talent triangle. In this particular case, sometimes you don't need to hire on a web designer. Okay? You don't need to hire your buddy who's going to be the UI interface designer. Because maybe you can get it cheaper, faster, better at one of these companies. And you can find an individual, freelancer.ca, or Elance, or a Elance, to actually do that work for you. I'm going to get to this in a little bit. It's about the plot. Okay? Because when you have nothing at the beginning, and you're starting your company, you're trying to get people sucked into your, your vacuum of you know, goodness and wanting to get that company to be the best it is, but those people are going to want something, right? They're going to want money, because what did I tell you? Never work for free, right? Okay. They're going to want a piece of the company, or they're going to want some prestige or something out of it. Remember, I think there's a little, a little bit of pizza. <coughs> so, hire a freelancer as opposed to, for a short term period of time, then hiring someone. Now, I can't stress this enough. Do not attempt to do your own legal work. Okay? Find a business lawyer. And lucky for us, over the last few years, the last five years, I've actually seen law firms who've got low-end startup or pro bono services. This is very important because when you start a company, you're going to need an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and you need a business agreement, you're going to, need, going to need employment agreements, amongst a million of other uh, papers and forms. Now, a lot of these things you can get online. You can get templates. You can get a te template NDA, you know, subtract your name, their name with your name, and, and you know, adjust the uh, requirements of it. Be very careful, though, that when it says under the legal requirements of the UK law, that you take that out and put it 
Ontario law. Okay? There's no Ontario law not being applicable. <coughs> Here's a couple of uh, uh, websites you can go to. Um, the law practice program here at the university just started. They're on the 10th floor of the digital media zone. And they've got 200 or 300 lawyers who come in from all walks of life, all styles and, and uh, startup departments, and they're looking for clients. A lot of them do pro bono work. So give them a call. Say, hey, I know you've got some uh, some practicing lawyers. Uh, is there anybody who can start a call? Can we talk to them? Can I talk to them? Uh, Illumian uh, Law is the DMC's official law uh, law firm for startups. It's a uh, law firm that's available to you. They provide pro bono work as well. And DocuSea.com provides templates that you can use for your everyday business. So really the, the name of the game here with a business lawyer is if you want to keep it cheap, do all the, the paperwork your, yourself. Get all those, those forms and all that together. Give that to the lawyer and say, is that okay? okay. Yeah? Uh, before day one. But honestly, I cannot stress this enough. Find a lawyer who is looking for a good startup situation. Lawyers are usually 350 an hour, somewhere around there. A uh, pro bono lawyer would usually give you two or three hours. A uh, cheaper startup lawyer would probably charge you about 150 bucks an hour. We get precious about our ideas, okay? I want you to get rid of that notion. Your idea is probably the same idea that's being generated about a thousand times across the world. Say, and I spent a lot of time in Nepal, so my idea about watching soccer on the internet is probably the same same idea my, my farmer buddy on 7,000 feet up <coughs> on the uh, uh, Nepali mountainside is thinking the same damn thing. It's just who's pastor to market, right? Who has the wherewithal? Who has the money, the resources, and the ability to get it out? Do not become precious with your ideas. People will come up with uh, great alterations of your same concept. <clears throat> Nobody knew SpongeBob SquarePants was going to be okay, right? Who would think that that thing would be a moment? Who would think Star Wars was going to make money, right? George Lucas, that was a fluke. What was the fluke? He didn't get paid for captive rights. Nobody would have known that. So don't be precious. Go get a lawyer. Find a lawyer. My uh, clicker keeps on going. Okay. This is really important. Get an accountant. Who is an accountant? All right, look at that in YouTube. Good for you guys. These are the money makers. They're the ones who are going to protect your nest egg. They're going to watch what you're spending. They're going to tell you what you can expense. Are all of you new businesses? You're thinking about starting a business, aren't you? Yes, I'm thinking about starting a new business. I'm exploring the opportunity. Um, what do you do? Oh, do you have a laptop? I do. Excellent. And how much it cost you? Uh, about $500. $500. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That's a business expense. And your business hasn't started. The CRA allows you, under the sole proprietor portion of your taxes, to be able to write off your laptop as a business expense. Because you're generating the potential for more now, I'm not going to get into corporation versus sole proprietor, but what I can tell you that if you're having coffee, who, who goes out for coffee and talks about business, starting up a company? Okay? You save your receipt? Why not, dude? Expense it. Yeah, 
I didn't uh, save the receipt on this today, and I should. That's three dollars and twenty-five cents, and I'm sure you know. Do you guys understand why I'm saying save your receipts? Because let's say you make um, ten dollars. You earn ten dollars. As a sole proprietor, your expense rate or your tax rate is probably let's just say forty percent. All right, count. So for every ten dollars, four dollars has to go back to the government. Now, let's just say that your expenses are nine dollars, but that laptop you bought is a buck, but the coffee, excuse me, is a, is a dollar, but the uh, car that I got my company name on, you know, I'm not being a pig about it, expensing everything on that car, but that car with my name on it. Funkworks.com is a bump. It all adds up to nine dollars. So I have earned ten dollars. I've got nine dollars in expenses. I subtract this from this. And how much money have I earned? One dollar. What do you pay taxes on? One dollar. You pay forty cents as opposed to four bucks. So getting an accountant to help you navigate what is expensable and when you can start expensing is very important. If you are planning to start a company now, I highly recommend that you save every receipt from this day forward. Any receipt, and not, not every receipt, not, the, not your pants, <coughs> new pants or new shoes, or new pants, or trainers, because clothing is non-expensable unless you're got work boots or work pants. Um, but if you need to have a big flat screen TV in order to do that uh, digital media, social media thing, then that's an expense. I'm a television producer, so Netflix is an expense for me. That's a whole part of my You can go back about three years, right? right? Roughly? Three years? Three years. Okay. Now, there are rules on the expenses. If it's over $5,000, Capital expenditure, which means that you can only write out a certain amount every year. If it's under five grand, generally they allow it as a one time write. Are we having an accounting? Uh, actually, we have accounting on Wednesday next week. All right. <laughs> Who's going to the accounting talk? Come on, let's see all your hands up. Yeah. Because even more than the lawyer, the accountant is going to save your bacon. Okay? They're going to tell you every nickel and dime that is available for you to use back in your home. But, you can't afford an account right at this moment. You can go and use a Canadian company called Wayback's uh, Budget Home, uh, Kiwili, QuickBooks. You've got to pay for QuickBooks. The first three kind of give you uh, Wayback's, actually, it yeah, gives you uh, their services for free. The one thing is that you're uploading information to them. Their servers are in Canada. This is an important thing. Does anybody use uh, Amazon servers or anything like that? Okay. Amazon servers are located where? In the U.S., which there means that they're subject to Homeland Security Protocol. Okay. So you need to uh, understand that if your material your expenses are going up to a Canadian site because they're secure on a Canadian website or uh, server, which means that they have to follow the proper protocol. And then uh, Certified General Accountants of Ontario is a great place for you to look for the potential to hook up with an account. Okay? Well, cool. Okay. How many people actually have a business how is it? Oh my God. There we go. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is my advice. If you love your family, don't include them in a business. Unless you are absolutely sure that you're happy with all the other baggage that comes with it. Okay? Yes? Don't start business with your roommate. Don't start business with your roommate. Okay. Let me make sure you leave. Uh, well, there we go. Now, are you out of that relationship? Huh? 
Thank you. Too much. Too much. Okay. So it's very, very important that um, you, you know, when you start out, your father or your mother may be an accountant or a lawyer, and they'll say, oh, you know, just let me do that for you. You need to rely on those accountants, and you need to rely on the lawyers. So you want your shit done now. You don't, even want, you don't want it done on Sunday afternoon while your mom's in between cooking dinner and uh, you know doing the laundry or whatever. Okay? Or your dad's in between playing golf and you know, he'll get to the accounting later, don't worry, you've got 10 years, it's okay. Buy the services, always pay for the services. Okay, I like this picture too. Went through this kind of 
turbulent time, right? And now, when I give these lectures, all I see is these Apple laptops looking at back at the next lap. Holy shit, what happened? How did they make their money? How did they become so successful? Brand, more important. Is the laptops. Laptops are a secondary business to them, right? Well, they sold like a part of a personal identity. Personal identity. There we go. So Apple was a wayward company until they found the product that identified them with personal identity. And that was what? The iPhone. Or, yeah. <coughs> so here's a couple of things. Oh, sorry. Uh, Guerrilla marketing. This guy in a suit goes out to the Dundas Square and hands out pamphlets. Actually, nobody's really tried that lately, so you may want to try it. Um, Guerrilla marketing is really good for us because we need to do things on the cheap. We can get our buddies, our friends, or whatever to help us do a, a quick pop up stand, do a quick guerrilla marketing event. Um, there's a great website, creativegrillmarketing.com, and it gives you all the great ideas in order to launch your own little marketing event. This is probably the only time where I would say use your friends and family to help you out with this. Yeah. I'm not a marketing expert, so that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm sure there's going to be marketing and startups as well. So. The other word of caution is uh, PR is not marketing. PR is about your narrative. That's the story about the company itself, about you and how you interact with the company or the object. So it's always about crafting the same story over and over again, and making sure that people resonate with that story. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Good. And PR is what everybody says about you, and you can pull that through there. There we go. Um, there's a couple of places, uh, Media Sync Online and Help a Reporter. Um, Help a Reporter I like a lot because you can log in as a non-reporter and suggest ideas for a reporter to come and do a report on. So for instance, it could be uh, science, live science experiments, which I think is a, a great PR thing. You know. So it's just about getting the word out there, getting your Twitter. So from a Twitter campaign, for your, I like your business, so I'm, I'm going to pick on it a little bit. You know, it would be, it would be like, what's your name? Man? My name is Anthony. Anthony. It'd be like Anthony if you were science uh, set up, right? You know, and that would be the Twitter image. And it would be something like, you know, come see my store, you know, as opposed to buy my product. Messages. Okay. Oh, we're getting one more slide and we're at, at the end. Exit strategy. As a um, bootstrapper, this is the last thing any, anybody ever thinks about. Before you start your company, I want you to think about what you're going to do. Yeah. The ship sinks. What will I do if the ship sinks? What will I do if it's just a bloody success? And what will I do if I sail? Now the guy who invented Minecraft, he got 2.5 billion dollars. What's he doing with his money? Anybody a ball in this guy? Preston, I forget, I forget his full name. The guy's like spending money left, right, and center. Of course, he's got 2.5 million bucks. He's spending money like it's one out of style. He's depressed. He's at home in this you know, Minecraft built, person built uh, luxury estate that he's got. He's going out of his mind because he didn't think about what his exit strategy is. 
can I use that money that I just got? And can I start a new company? Can I create a new venture fund? Can I find myself climbing Mount Everest and all the other mountains in the world? You need to figure out what you will do in the event of. Nobody ever thinks about, I'm going to fail, right? Is failure accepted in this society? No, it should be. You should fail. Remember what I said before? Fail, fail often. Especially if you're in school right now, fail as much as you can. Because I want you to fail now, as opposed to when you have to spend fifty to hundred thousand dollars out in the business world. You fail once, and that costs a lot of money. Don't do the same mistake twice. But at least experiment. Be able to try out new things. So, if the ship sinks, be prepared. I'm going to tell you a little backstory. So, my dad, you guys are okay with the story, personal story, right? We love them. Okay, good. I love telling them, too. So, I come from a long family of entrepreneurs. I mean, my great grandfather uh, was a uh, tailor, a little four foot, four foot three tailor guy who went off to Vimy Ridge. Uh, 14 years old. He was a trained tailor. So guess what he was doing for cigarettes and food at the Ridge? He was sewing up people's stuff. He actually survived the first, uh, the first over the hill. Um, my grandfather, he was a pharmacist. Okay? <clears throat> and he was a typical country pharmacist. He sold drugs, for old ladies in their you know, 40s or 50s and 60s, and you know, bubble gum and candy bars and all this other stuff. Whatever was needed to keep the business going. His company called Carter Drugs was actually, its license was bought out by law books. Now, if you look at the law books thing, you will see Carter Drugs because part of the uh, thing, part of the requirement of having a drugstore is to buy the license. My father was a um, was entrepreneurial in spirit, uh, not very good at business. Oh, no, he, um, he was a firefighter back in the 60s. And you know what do firefighters do on their days off? Well, they're plumbers, they're electricians, they're construction workers, sometimes they're cops. And uh, so basically back in the 60s, when you're making $4,000 a year to run into a burn in the you got to make a lot of money order to survive. So my father decided he was going to take his passion, his love of fishing, and open up a tackle box, a store that you could buy fishing rods and reels and lures and all that other stuff. We called it the tackle box. So I grew up at that bloody store from age six all the way until I went bankrupt at age 22, every day, and I hate fishing. I absolutely hate it. But, like my turn at selling motorcycles, which I also won't ride, I could sell a lot of them. I could sell a lot of lures, I could sell a lot of reels, and so forth. I got to understand what it was like when a customer came in and said, hey, I got this problem. And you start picking up on that. Now my father, however, he, took his passion and made it into a business, which means what? Test the market. And test the market. That's a good one. It's also close to his heart, right? So when he wasn't working the fire department, he was working capital, vice versa. And then over the year, he was smart in you know, one instance. He put the store right across from the beer store. So I don't know if anybody's seen a fisherman before, but we always go for our beer first and then to the tackle store next. So that worked out. But one year, the city decided to rip up the road in between the, the beer store and the tackle store. My dad wasn't getting any clients. So for a whole year, he wasn't getting any people coming in. He was borrowing money, 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 money to keep the thing going without realizing that maybe I was got to jump. You've got to know what your exit is. Subsequently, he exited in bankruptcy. Now, the one thing about my father is a stand-up guy, so he spent the next 10 
name, most people in the business would go bankrupt, which is say, well, screw you, and then go off and start a new company with somebody else because you can't go, you can't start another company uh, and be the prime director or whatever. My point being is that when I started my company, the first thing I said to myself was, I'm not going bankrupt and I'm not leaving, owing anybody any money. So I only bought what I could when I had to. I saved all my money. And when my partners wanted to go out and go to Cuba and have a, you know, a company vacation and all that, I said no, because that is a capital efficient. My exit strategy was when the company closed, I handed them the keys, I left the money in my pocket, and all my employees were happy. And that's what happened. So that's what I asked you guys to do. I asked you to think about what will happen when the company shuts down. If you become filthy rich, what are you going to do next? Or if you sell. So am I going to be part of this new operation? Am I going to be there for a year? Am I going to be there for six months? Am I going to like it when somebody else is playing with my baby? So remember, this company that you've created, this business that you've been working so hard on, it's yours, and only you are responsible for it. And that, my friends, is it. <laughs>